Good morning, and thank you for joining me on the Path to Liberty. It's Monday, January 10th, 2022. And today in history, January 10th, 1776, Thomas Paine's pamphlet, 47 pages, Common Sense, was first published in Philadelphia. You'll find some later editions that maybe are 48 pages, etc. But it quickly became the most widely read document on American liberty in history. It was not only a scathing attack on the institution of a monarchy, so unlimited centralized power, but it was probably the most inspiring and concise defense of the patriot cause to the typical, to the average person. So on this episode, I'm going to briefly highlight some of the main arguments and points that Payne made in this document. And let's be real here. There's absolutely no chance, no chance at all, that I can do this great work the justice it deserves. But first of all, before getting to that, I'm going to try my best. First of all, before getting to that, my name is Michael Bolden. We broadcast live every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 9.30 a.m. Pacific time from here in my home office and studio in downtown Los Angeles for the 10th Amendment Center. Our show homepage has everything you need to follow this show. It's got all the archives. We're closing in on four years now. I really got to keep track of episode numbers at some point. Maybe someone can help me out with that. But we got almost four years of, of previous episodes on tons of different topics. Each uh, episode, I publish an individual blog post, which has all the different platforms, uh, all the video platforms, all the audio platforms, plus all the stuff that I reference. There's not going to be as many original source documents because I'm primarily referencing Payne's work, but I also got some other articles talking about uh, the history as well and some historians raving about how important this was. So you'll find all that information on each individual blog post. And plus, you can find our membership program where you can put your financial faith behind our work for as little as two bucks a month. And we make it go a long, long, long way in support of the Constitution of Liberty. My great friend Tom Woods once said, no one on earth has done more to advance the great Jeffersonian principles of nullification than the TAC. And we do that through understanding the history, the foundational principles that set up the Constitution through the revolutionary time and how to apply what the founders and old revolutionaries told us to do today. Anyways, show homepage, 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. And while we allow people a few more moments to get notifications from the mainstream platforms because they're slow uh, and uh, they can join us in the live stream, I want to say hello to everyone out in the live chat. There's Tim Martin in Arizona, Cheriton Farmer in Missouri. There's 10th Amendment Center saying happy Monday. <laughs> I buzzed that a few minutes before we started. Anyways, Dave Simmons, Clay Kent, Andrew Green, good to see you, buddy. Gun A, Cowboy Roy Rogers, uh, Larry Clark, I think I already mentioned, Haji in Michigan, and everyone else. I apologize if I missed anybody. I'm just kind of skimming through because I want to get right to this. And let's start out with a pretty kind of a generic introduction here from history.com. But I think it's a good start because they talked about the hostilities that started in 1775. And Payne actually references April 1775, and I'll get to that in a few, as a motivation for him specifically. And here at History.com, they say, even after armed hostilities broke out between the American colonists and British forces in 1775, many prominent colonists seem re seemed reluctant to consider the idea of actually breaking away from Britain and instead insisted that they were still its loyal subjects, even as they resisted what they saw as its tyrannical laws and unfair taxation. We know in July of 1775, John Dickinson and Thomas Jefferson authored the Declaration of Causes, why they were taking up arms. They specifically said, why should we list all of our issues in detail? Why do we need to go through all of the problems, the various problems? Because they have, by one statute, passed the power to, uh, they claim the power over us in all cases whatsoever, specifically all cases whatsoever. So unlimited centralized authority. They said, well, we're going to have to stand. We're going to have to fight for our own freedom until you back down from that. Until that changes, 
we're not going anywhere. So they're recognizing here at history.com that the motivation really, really started pushing forward. I mean, there was stuff back in 1763, which Payne also mentioned, but 1775, April specifically. And here they go on, they say, a single 47-page pamphlet did a lot to quickly change that and shift American sentiment towards independence. Common sense was in part a scathing polemic against the injustice of rule by a king. So unlimited, centralized, infallible sovereign power. The idea that someone could hold final authority or sovereignty and it wasn't the people. Power did not flow from the people. There was, I would say, the first third of this pamphlet was really about, we can call it a book, this pamphlet was really about the institution of that centralized power under a monarchy. Well, they go on, they said, its author also made an equally eloquent argument that Americans had a unique opportunity to change the course of history by creating a new sort of government in which people were free and had the power to rule themselves. And here they have a really nice picture. This is not the original publication because it does, a mention, it does mention the appendix. And the appendix is something, the version that has, we have it in our power to begin the world over again. We see that one more often than most. Now going a little bit forward here, let me just grab my notes, to Jim Powell. This is an old school article from the 90s over at FEE, Foundation for Economic Education. They've got so much good content over there. FEE.org. Of course, I will link to that in the show notes. TenthAmendmentCenter.com slash path to liberty is where you find all that stuff. And here's how Jim put it. He said in early September, so September 1775. So he Payne started making notes for a pamphlet. He probably started writing around the 1st of November. And of course, Payne talked about in his document, and I'm not going to just highlight every quote there, but he talked about he was on board. There was no one, he said, that was more on board for reconciliation. Let's work this out until April 19th, 1775. We know that was the Battle of Lexington. So at that point, he was like, there is no chance of a peaceful resolution of this. This is going, they want war. We, I don't want war. He talked about it in the American crisis. There's no way I would ever support an offensive war because I think it's murder. But when they invade your home and steal your stuff and take all your rights, you have to defend yourself. It's your moral duty. And so he started writing, uh, taking notes and really started putting it together in November of 75. Powell goes on, he says he discussed the evolving draft. And I don't think a lot of people know this history. He was involved working on this with Dr. Benjamin Rush, whom he had met at Aiken's bookstore. The draft was completed in early December. Payne also got comments from David Rittenhouse, an astronomer, astronomer, Samuel Adams, and Benjamin Franklin. Now, Franklin, of course, was very influential in getting Payne over to the U.S., and he hadn't even been, well, to the U.S., to the colonies at the time, and he hadn't even been an American. He was still an Englishman at that point. Thought of calling his, He thought of calling his pamphlet Plain Truth, but Benjamin Rush was the one that recommended the more earthy common sense. That's an interesting way of putting it by uh, uh, Dr. Rush, or Dr. Powell put it earthy. Anyway, so Benjamin Rush actually made the arrangements for that first publication in Boston on January 10th, 1776. Payne actually signed over the royalties of it to the Continental Congress. He, I don't think he expected to uh, sell a ton of these. I don't think he expected to become famous. He's, he, I mean, I don't think he expected anything. He was just doing his moral duty, trying to urge people to get this done. But it really, really resonated, and whatever was sold helped fund the resistance effort. That's, again, from Jim Powell. Now, the first, like I said, the first third or so, maybe 40%, really spends its time delegitimizing the monarchy, the idea of a monarchy, and also what he called both the absurdity of a hereditary succession. But his first sentence, and we'll get to that in just a moment, his first sentence really gets to the heart of many of the problems that they had at that point and also of what we face today. This is the first sentence of Common Sense. He said, some writers have so confounded society with government as to leave little or no distinction between them, whereas they are not only different, but have different origins. Every problem under the sun that should be solved by the marketplace or by societal interests, by people in their own area, so many people today have confounded the idea of society with the only solution has to be a government solution. Every time there's a problem, people run to government, whether it's courts or state governments or local governments or federal governments. And Payne recognized this problem all the way back 
1775 and 1776, clearly, and people are still confounding. They're confusing the difference. They're confusing these greatly different things, society and government. He goes on with this. Society in every state is a blessing, but government, even in its best state, now he's not a big advocate for government here, but he's saying even in its very best state is a necessary evil. It's still an evil, even at its best case. And in most situations, it never even gets close to its best case. Anyway, society in every state is a blessing, but government, even in its best state, is but a necessary evil. In its worst state, an intolerable one. For when we suffer or are exposed to the same miseries by a government, which we might expect in a country without a government, our calamity is heightened by reflecting that we furnish the means by which we suffer. Now, remember today, we furnish the means by which we suffer. That's always been the issue with despotic rule, with every government rule, even ones that you think are doing the good, the good things. They are harming other people. So it's always you. We are furnishing the means by which we suffer. And again, he then from there, he really goes into his hammering on the institution of the monarchy, the unlimited centralized power of that institution, the idea that one person can be sovereign. He really focused on the absurdity and the evil of hereditary succession. Those were his own words. And he put it this way. In short, monarchy and succession have laid not this or that kingdom only, but the world in blood and ashes. And now we don't necessarily have as many like individual hereditary monarchs, but there are these command and control governments of the last century or so that have certainly done the same type of thing, laid the world in blood and ashes. He said, "'Tis a form of government which the word of God bears testimony against, and blood will attended. So he spent a bunch of time. I'm not going to go through all the opposition to the monarchy. I think this is really important to read so you can get an understanding of what was going on and what they were fighting against. It really was not about the, the American Revolution. This change of thought that led to the war for independence was really just not about having representatives to tax them. John Hancock rejected that as well in his speech, uh, his, his uh, Boston Massacre, his Massacre Oration Day speech as well. It was really about this unlimited centralized power. And then from there, Payne went on to, his, to reject reasons for rec reconciliation. There were a number of them floating out there. Of course, the British really wanted the, the people to back down. And a lot of the patriots thought like, oh, they're trying to trick us. Payne specifically was probably the most eloquent in doing this. They're going to get us to back down on our opposition, but they're not going to really take away the most grievous power that is, the power over us in all cases whatsoever, and then we're just going to have a problem in a few years. So he said, I have heard it asserted by some that as America has flourished under her former connection with Great Britain, that same connection is necessary toward her future happiness and will always have the same effect. So in other words, we've been prosperous we are all, we're the richest country right now, or maybe close to it. We're doing pretty good. And if we get rid of that centralized, far off government, we're screwed. We're going to be poor and miserable. And we hear the same kind of garbage today. If we don't have the centralized, so called federal government protecting us and making us rich and better and improving our lives in so many ways, we're going to be in a lot of trouble. He said, I answered, he first of all, he said, he said, this, there's nothing more fallacious than that. He said, I answer roundly that America would have flourished as much and probably more had no European power taken any notice of her. So he's basically saying what I've heard many great Austrian economists say today, that when people are rich or doing well or we have a strong middle class, which is actually getting destroyed more and more year in and year out, and maybe we'll look back on this time and learn quite a bit about this in the decades to come. But we've also, I've also heard a lot of people say that, oh, the flourishing is in spite. Can you imagine how much better it would be had they just kept the hell out of the way? And that's what Payne is getting at here as well. Sure, things are good, but we have, would have been as good, if not better, had they just been away from us. He said, the commerce by which she hath enriched herself are the necessities of life. And will always has, have a market while eating is the custom of Europe. So as long as people need to stay alive, the trade that uh, America could do was always going to have a market. And then the next thing, of course, is, well, they're keeping us safe. And if anything, left, right, and center today, they're always like, 
Soon as they think there's some kind of danger, fear is the foundation of government, wrote John Adams, who did, wasn't a huge fan of Thomas Paine. There's a really interesting book, and I'm kind of getting off the rails here, Adams versus Paine and the vision in 1776 for what would come. But Adams was absolutely correct. The more that people are afraid, the more that they run the government. Government will supposedly protect them. And Payne didn't use that same term here, that same phrase, but he's talking about this idea that people think that Great Britain was keeping them safe. We hear this today, that government agencies are keeping us safe. Okay, well, this one's bad, but we can't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Uh, we can't even have a reduction in the size of national defense spending. It has to always go up and up and up, even though it's more than the next eight to 10 countries on earth combined. And this is pure insanity. Here's Payne, he said, we have boasted the protection of Great Britain without considering that her motive was interest, not attachment. So why are they doing this? Do they even care about us? They're probably doing it for their own gain. And that she did not protect us from our enemies on our account, but from her enemies on her own account. And that's what leads to things like we were always at war with East Asia, or was it Oceania? One of those. They change it around and they're protecting themselves. They don't care about us. They just want to convince us that what they need to accomplish to have more power and control and more money and riches for them and their friends and their supporters is in our own interest. But that's always been nonsense by these centralized powers. And he goes on, he said, from those who had no quarrel with us on any other account and those who will always be our enemies on the same account. So it's always been a scam, this idea that they are protecting us. But really what he's saying is we just want free trade. We want peace. We, and free trade will bring us that peace. He said our plan is commerce and that well attended to will secure us the peace and friendship of all Europe. So free trade was one of the leading principles of the American Revolution. It wasn't just about having representatives to rip them off through taxation. They wanted free trade, which would lead to peace. And that's probably why President Thomas Jefferson, in his first inaugural, I'm pretty sure, in 1801, told us that his administration would pursue peace, commerce, and honest friendship with all nations entangling alliances with none. It's kind of similar to what Paine had to say here. He said, as Europe is our market for trade, we ought to form no partial connection with any part of it. Free trade with all, peace, on commerce, and honest friendship with everyone, entangling alliances with none. That's the same thing that Jefferson said some years later as president. He said, it is the true interest of America to steer clear of European contentions, which she can never do while by her dependence on Britain she has made the make weight in the scale of British politics. So the British were using American trade, American ports, American riches as a way to use leverage on other countries. And there is no way to have that peace throughout Europe and throughout the world and have the most prosperity possible, the most freedom possible, as long as they were subjects of this centralized power. And so then he went on to, re to give reasons why he thought reconciliation was going to be a, a, a total failure. And again, he specifically said there was no one more on board with reconciliation than I was until that fateful day of April 19th, 1775, Lexington. And so he goes on. He says, first, the powers of governing still remain in the hands of the king. So he spent all this time talking about this unlimited centralized power, this unlimited sovereignty of the king. The king can just say whatever he wants. And at the end of the day, they had no authority to make any laws unless it was given approval by this far off king. He said he will have a negative over the whole legislation of this continent. So even if we have short term peace, he still has that power. Even if he's a good guy today, he may not be a good guy in a year or 10 years, and he may be gone. And the next person who has that power, it's that classic phrase that we often have heard throughout history, that whatever power you give government today to do things that you like will eventually be in the hands of other people to do stuff against you or do the exact opposite. And Payne was warning about that in 1776. And then secondly, he said that even as the best terms which we can expect to obtain can amount to no more than a temporary expedient, which can last no longer than till the colonies come of age, so the general face and state of things in the interim will be unsettled and unpromising. Short version, the best we can do is have a temporary peace 
with them temporary backing off because they're claiming this power over us in all cases whatsoever. And he actually took that argument further and specifically mentioned that in his first American Crisis essay in December of 1776, just before Christmas, just before the crossing of the Delaware. I covered that just last uh, December, uh, last couple of weeks in another episode that I don't have handy here. Uh, but if I remember, I'll include a link to that in the show notes. And he specifically said, hey, no matter what they offer us, we can't have peace because whatever they offer us, it'll only be temporary because they claim the power over us in all cases whatsoever. Today, the central government, we, I mean, it's supposedly a federal government, they claim the power over us in all cases whatsoever through their misinterpretation and twisting of the supremacy clause. They claim that all federal law is always supreme no matter what. And that's a lie. And it's the same type of a lie that they that they had back then. This was the Declaratory Act. Some people call it the intolerable. I covered this in an episode last year, March of 2021. Unlimited centralized power in all cases whatsoever. I think it's incredibly important to understand that essential principle of the American Revolution. And I will link to that in the show notes as well. So then he went on to note that some people would be a, a, afraid of separation without a new plan. Like, oh, we can't just be without some kind of structure here. The Articles of Confederation wasn't even proposed, so he actually recommended, hey, let's get together, let's have a plan of representation, and he actually recommended a Congress with 390 delegates. He wanted actual close to representation. Of course, you can't have representation, as Brutus, the great anti-federalist writer, wrote back in uh, 1788, 1787. He talked about representation being impossible, even if you have one representative for every 10, because you have 10 different potential interests, that one person can't do it. But the closer you get to the individual, the closer you actually get towards real representation. So he was rec recommending 390 delegates. And then he also recommended what would basically be a constitutional convention. He said, we got to have delegates get together. Here's how many we need. We can put together this charter for the country, blah, blah, blah. And he said, in this charter, we should have things like securing freedom and property to all, and above all things, the free exercise of religion according to the dictates of conscience. So he was talking about some of the essential natural rights, freedom and property as well. And then he goes on and he rejects the idea that some people still wanted a king. And of course, even after the war for independence, some people wanted to actually make someone like George Washington into a king. And had he not been someone, even if we don't like how he did some things as president, he certainly had a moral code that he held by and he rejected this. Someone of a bad moral character would have seen all that power being handed to them and taken it. So we can be very grateful for the fact, and some writers talked about that years later, we can be grateful for the fact that he refused to do that. And so Payne says, but where, say some, is the king of America? If we're going to be free, we need someone to protect us. We need some level of authority here. And he's like, this is nonsense. And of course, he had just recommended 390 delegates, a very decentralized approach. Some of these history sites, and I'm not sure if it was history.com, but you'll see it. Some of these mainstream organizations and so-called experts, they'll say Payne wanted a strong centralized government. In this, and he called for that because it was going to protect rights and stuff like that. Nah, I I could do a probably a couple of hours talking about how that's absurd. The fact that he recommended 390 delegates, the fact that he spent the first third of the document opposing centralized power, I would actually strongly disagree with that. So he says, where's the king? I'll tell you, friend, he reigns above and doth not make havoc of mankind like the royal brute of Great Britain. He did not hold back. So far as we approve of monarchy in America, he said, the law is king. For as in absolute governments, the king is law, in free countries, the law ought to be king, and there ought to be no other. So that's a really powerful statement as well. And then he went through a few pages, it's a whole section, to state his observations on what he called the present ability. Can we get this done? We know that in the in the beginning of winter in December of 76, he actually recognized, well, maybe we rushed into this and now we're struggling, but now we're here, so we have to push on. But he wrote about having the largest body of armed people on earth. But he said it wasn't just a numbers game. The militia was incredibly important. It wasn't just a numbers game. It was really about unity in thought. And this was a rare time. He actually did predict. 
He said maybe in the next fifth, half a century is how he put it. He said the next 50 years or so, we might see these colonies really kind of self-interested and at each other's throats. I mean, I don't know if he predicted what would be the war between the states, the so-called civil war, but he did mention, like, this is a time. This is not something that we see happen too often. He also pointed out there was no debt, so they could take on debt to raise a formal army. And there were tons and tons of natural resources. In short, it was a no time like the present. And here's how Payne put it. The present time, likewise, is that peculiar t peculiar time. I have a trouble, hard time with that word, sorry, which never happens to a nation but once. This is something that you only get one opportunity, Payne was saying. So let's take this. He said, most nations have let slip the opportunity and by that means have been compelled to receive laws from their conquerors instead of making laws for themselves. So are they going to be a self-governing society or are they going to be a conquered society? He then wrapped it up in this first publication. Of course, there's an appendix in the future ones. And this, this version of it that I have from Liberty Fund dot org is one with an appendix. I'm not sure which edition it is, but it's a really good one and it's easy to read. I will link to it in the show notes, of course, 10th Amendment Center dot com slash path to liberty. I'll publish that blog sometime an hour or two after this live stream is done. So he had four primary reasons that he gave. He closed it out why they need independence now, not later, but now. And it's so important. And first he said, hey, you know, Another nation might come in and mediate this. We might actually get some help, but we're not going to get that help if we don't declare independence. He said, it's the custom of nations when any two are at war for some other powers not engaged to step in as mediators. He says, but while America calls herself the subject of Great Britain, no power, however well disposed she may be, can offer her mediation. So there was no chance for help. And they needed help. They were certainly outmatched, but even though they had all those arms, they knew they were facing the most powerful empire in the history of the world at that point. We certainly have that situation today. So first, we might get some help, but we have to be our own nation first or a collection of 13 free and independent sovereign nations first. He said, secondly, it is unreasonable to suppose that France or Spain will give us any assistance if we mean only to make use of that assistance for the purpose of repairing the breach. So if we don't make it clear that we are done with Britain, there is, again, zero chance of getting help. We know that help to win the war for independence was incredibly important over time, and Payne recognized that very much early on here in January of 1776. And then third, he says, while we profess ourselves the subjects of Britain, we actually might be inviting trouble from these other nations. Like if we're fighting back at this point and if we don't actually declare independence, not only are we not going to get help, they might be against us because they're bad. They're awful. We know Payne spent a lot of time in France uh, and arguing against the British later on as well. And he knew that if we look too uppity and stayed part of Great Britain, they wouldn't be too happy about it. He said, while we profess ourselves the subjects of Britain, we must, in the eyes of foreign nations, be considered as rebels. The precedent is somewhat dangerous to their peace. So the other countries are going to be worried that as long as there's just rebels looking for what they want rather than trying to break away and have an actual list of reasons, compelling list of reasons why, which we know Jefferson and, and the committee put together in the Declaration of Independence following the instruction from Richard Henry Lee's resolution on July 2nd, 1776. Without that, they were going to look really problematic. And he actually calls for an, a declaration of independence. That's his fourth thing. He says, we're a manifesto to be published and dispatched to foreign courts, setting forth the miseries we have endured and the peaceful methods which we have ineffectually used for redress, declaring at the same time, et cetera, et cetera. Read that. He's basically saying not only did he call for a constitutional convention, basically the precursor to the Articles of Confederation in this, he also actually called for a declaration of independence to be sent to all the courts of Europe to actually show them they weren't just being rebels, they had real reason. And if people, other nations agreed they had real reason, or if those other nations thought it was in their political interest, they would get help and they would succeed. He said, such a memorial would produce more good effects to this continent than if a ship were freighted with petitions 
to Britain. No more petitions is what he's saying. We can't beg for the British to do the right thing. It's over. So that was really the end of the first edition. And in the second or the third, he actually included uh, this appendix where he talks about how the Rubicon has been crossed. The birthday of a new world is at hand. We have it in our power to begin the world over again. And Dave Benner, we've been uh, running this article from him. It's a blog post that he does. Uh, He's actually writing a book on Thomas Paine right now. I have not read any of it yet, but Dave's research is really, really excellent, and I love his blogging and his articles that he's done and his previous uh, work in publication form, and so I'm really excited to see that as well. So Dave is Dave's my Thomas Paine guy, we'll put it that way. And so here's how Dave put it a couple years ago. He said, in just 47 pages, and I think he put 48 originally, and so that might be, they, he added some statistics in one of the later editions that talked about the cost of building a Navy and things like that. He said, common sense made the following arguments, and he made seven points. And I want to just highlight a couple of them. Three, many traditional rights were naturally bestowed and pre-existed government. So Paine was a natural rights guy. He recognized that rights are not gifts from government. If it comes with a government permission slip, it's a privilege. It's uh, you're lucky. It's not liberty. Two, legitimate government depends on the consent of the governed. If it's someone with a hereditary succession, that is not consent. That's force. And then also that a free people. You're not a free people if you can't withdraw from illegitimate government. And as such, a government ceased to possess the ability to demand compliance. We heard this from John Adams, from John Dickinson, from Patrick Henry, Samuel Adams, and so many others in the resistance to the Stamp Act, you are not obliged to obey them when they do stuff that they're not authorized to do in the first place. And here's how Benner summed it up. His blunt, straightforward style resonated strongly with common people, making his work an immediate success. And we can't really, there's a lot of people who throw out figures. There's some interesting research on this over at All Things Liberty, which is the Journal of the American Revolution, talking about how Well, the first 100,000 report, and we know that Payne signed over the royalties, and he actually fell out with the first Robert Bell, not my friend Robert Scott Bell, who does Monday through Sunday through Friday at noon Pacific time, uh, a show on health and uh, political freedom. But anyways, we know he kind of fell out. So I don't think there's any way that Payne really could have tracked the orders, but uh, how many were sold? He said 100,000, then later on he said 120, and later on he said 150, and then the half million came many, many decades later. So we don't really know how many were sold. There's no way to really track it. Some estimates say right off the bat probably 75,000. Anyways, it was the most widely read, and it really did spark this because it spoke to the common person. And the common person was far more important important than the people who spoke with legalese. And Dave talks about this as well. His straightforward style resonated strongly with common people, making his work an immediate success, though some, including Jefferson, James Otis, and James Iredell, had all articulated similar ideas in the years prior. Many of their arguments were coded in legalese and historical references that were unfamiliar to typical colonists. It was Payne's work, therefore, that struck the greatest chord with the everyday American, and that's why it was so important. And here's even Bernard Balin, back in the 1970s, a historian over at AmericanHeritage.com. He put it this way, and Gordon Wood, uh, another great historian, if you've read some history books on the American Revolution, you probably know these names, Gordon S. Wood, also referred to Payne's common sense, very similar to what Balin had to say. Bernard writes, common sense is the most brilliant pamphlet written during the American Revolution and one of the most brilliant pamphlets ever written in the American language. How it could have been produced by the bankrupt Quaker corset maker, the sometime teacher, preacher and grocer and twice dismissed excise officer who happened to catch Benjamin Franklin's attention in England and who arrived in America only 14 months before common sense was published is nothing one can explain without explaining genius itself. He wasn't even there back in 1763 and 1765 and 1770. But here's Bernard Balin calling him genius with common sense. 
He says it is a work of genius, slapdash as, as it is, rambling as it is, crude as it is. It burst from the press, Benjamin Rush wrote, with an effect which has rarely been produced by types and papers in any age or country. Its effect, Benjamin Franklin said, was prodigious. Well, I hope you guys found this interesting. I hope it was educational. I hope it encourages you to read this short pamphlet, short book from Thomas Paine. Whether it's today or any day of the year, it's so important for us to understand these founding principles so we can actually build a foundation for liberty in the future. And today, I mean, we can try, but it's a very difficult time, certainly today. I know I did not do it the justice it deserves, but I definitely did my best to highlight things that I thought were important that would actually encourage you to actually check this out a little bit further. I will link to all the stuff that I've been talking about in the show notes, 10th Amendment Center dot com slash path to liberty. I appreciate uh, uh, Clay Kent saying awesome as usual. And. Uh, it looks like there's a lot of chat out there. I'm going to have to check that out a little bit later on because I'm running a little bit longer than I had hoped to today, and I got to get back to a few other things as well. So I will read through the comments a little bit later today, whether it's live or in the archive. And if you leave comments in the archive or a review on Apple Podcasts or any other podcast platform, if you smash a like button on Facebook or YouTube or anywhere else, you retweet on Twitter, all that stuff will trigger the algorithm and tell the platform to show this specific program to more people. It helps out a ton, especially with the podcasts and the reviews on Apple and Podbean and elsewhere. I am actually blown away by how many people we've been getting. It's not huge by any stretch of the imagination, but I'm just surprised that when we first started, we were getting on the podcast, maybe a hundred or so listens. I only started it as a video program, then I eventually added podcasts because some people are saying, I can't do this. I got to have just audio only. So I started just repurposing it as a podcast. And now we get anywhere from three to 5,000 listens per episode just on the audio edition. So I'm very grateful for that. It's nowhere I, where I, I think we could be, but I'm to me, I'm just blown away because I didn't even intend to start this as a podcast. Uh, and then, of course, our membership program, 10thamendmentcenter.com slash members. They start out at just two bucks a month. Please do not feel obligated to join us or throw any cash our way. But if you are financially capable of doing that, I'd be extremely grateful for any help you can give us. There's nothing that helps us roll up our sleeves and do this kind of work every single day, more than the financial faith and support of our members. Again, I really appreciate you being here. I hope you enjoyed the episode. I hope your week is off to a good start, and I'll see you next time here on the Path to Liberty.